Welcome to our deep dive. Today we're looking into a life that stretched over a century and uh, a mind that really forced physics itself to rethink some fundamental rules. We're talking about Chen Ding Yang, the Nobel laureate who passed away recently. He was 103. A remarkable age, truly. Absolutely. And his impact. Well, it's hard to overstate. He was central to showing the, a law of nature, something physicists thought was absolute, was actually wrong. That's right. Xinhua confirmed his passing Chen Ning Yang, Chinese-American physicist, Nobel winner, died on a Saturday in Beijing after an illness. But like you said, 103 years is incredible. But the real story, the focus for us, is that scientific explosion he helped trigger back in the 50s. Exactly. And that's our mission today. We want to get past the headlines and really understand how Yang, working with his colleague Sung Dao Li, didn't just adjust the theory. No, they completely dismantled this idea of mirror symmetry deep inside the atom. Right. What happens when the universe, you know, fundamentally can tell left from right. It's fascinating. It really is. So to grasp how big this shift was, we need to look at his background. Where did he come from? Yang was born back in 1922, Hefei, Anhui province in eastern China. And it seems academia was in his blood from the start. Oh, definitely. Yeah, the records show he grew up right there on the Tsinghua University campus just outside Beijing. His father was a math professor there. That's such a key detail, isn't it? Imagine growing up surrounded by that kind of thinking, that constant intellectual rigor. He did his undergraduate and master's degrees at Chinese universities, building this really strong theoretical foundation. That grounding was crucial later when he started challenging, well, the global consensus. And then came the big move, the shift west. This was right after World War II ended. That's right. He came to the U.S. on a fellowship, University of Chicago. Chicago. Wow. That must have been an electric atmosphere for physics back then. Absolutely electric. The post-war era, it was just an explosion in particle physics, new tools, brilliant minds converging. And maybe the biggest influence on Yang there was Professor Enrico Fermi. Fermi, the name behind the first nuclear reactor. The very same. Italian physicist later became an American citizen, creator of the world's first artificial nuclear reactor, being Fermi's student. That put Yang right at the absolute cutting edge, learning about fundamental forces, the stuff that holds matter together. You know, that makes sense. That kind of mentorship from someone like Fermi must have given him the confidence, maybe the framework, to ask those really difficult questions later on. I think so. It provides a certain intellectual toolkit. And his career path solidified pretty quickly after that. From 1949, he was at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Right, Einstein's old stomping grounds. Exactly. He became a full professor there in 1955. Mm. And just two years later, boom, his work hits the world stage. Okay, let's dive into that Nobel Prize work, because this is really the heart of it, isn't it? It is. He shared the 1957 Nobel in Physics with Sung Dao Lee, and they won it for questioning something called the parity laws. So if symmetry was this, you know, universally trusted thing in physics, why? Why did they even look twice at it? What did they see that everyone else was missing? That's the million dollar question, really. Because the belief in symmetry, particularly this parity symmetry, it was. It was total. Physicists didn't just accept the parity laws, they depended on them. The core idea was what gets called mirror symmetry or sometimes piece symmetry. Okay, break that down. What did mirror symmetry actually imply for, like, tiny particles. Okay, so imagine any physical process happening at the subatomic level, an interaction, a decay, anything. Mirror symmetry basically said that if you watch the exact mirror image of that process, like looking at it in a reflection, that reflected process should be just as possible, just as real as the original one. Uh -huh. The fundamental laws of physics weren't supposed to care about left or right. They should look the same in the mirror. Right. So if I'm watching, say, a particle spinning and breaking down, if I filmed it, the original film and a mere reverse version should be indistinguishable in terms of physical possibility. Nature shouldn't have a preference for left-handed or right-handed processes. Precisely. It felt right, intuitively. It was mathematically elegant. It was yeah. just assumed. A cornerstone of physics, both classical and quantum. Symmetry was almost taken for granted, but Yang and Li, they were looking closely at some puzzling data coming from certain particle decays, specifically decays involving the weak nuclear force. Uh, the weak force. Okay, quick sidebar, remind us. Yeah. What does the weak force actually do? It's one of the four fundamental forces, right? Good point. Yes, one of the four. Gravity, electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force, and then the weak force. 
It's much more subtle than the others. Its main job is governing certain kinds of radioactivity, like beta decay. It's how fundamental particles, quarks, and leptons can actually change their type, their identity. Okay. Now, the other force is gravity, EM, the strong force. They all seem to conserve parity just fine. They obeyed mirror symmetry. Yang and Li's radical idea was, essentially, what if the weak force doesn't? What if it's the odd one out? So they didn't find a new particle or anything like that. They found a flaw in a basic assumption. Exactly. They basically said, look, if a particle decay happens via the weak force, maybe the outcome does show a preference. Maybe the particles tend to spin one way more than the other or fly off in a certain direction relative to their spin, a definite handedness. That was their theoretical proposal, yeah. Based purely on analyzing the mathematics and the existing somewhat confusing experimental data. They argued that this fundamental symmetry principle might be violated specifically by the weak force. And here's the kicker. The physics community was so used to symmetry being universal, they hadn't really performed experiments designed specifically to test parity conservation in weak interactions. No way, they just assumed. Pretty much. The assumption was, well, if the strong force and electromagnetism respect mirror symmetry, then surely all fundamental forces must. It was a huge blind spot. Okay, so they published this theoretical paper in 1956. What happened next? Did it take years for anyone to prove them right or wrong? Not at all. And this is where the story gets really exciting. Their paper wasn't just theory. It actually suggested specific experiments that could test their idea. And within months literally months, a team led by another brilliant physicist, Qian Shengwu, set up an experiment. Wow, that fast. Incredibly fast. They looked at the beta decay of cobalt-60 atoms cooled way down, and the results were unambiguous. They proved Yang and Li were absolutely correct. Parity was not conserved in weak interactions. Within months, the confirmation was almost immediate. That must have sent, I mean, just huge shockwaves through physics, right? Oh, enormous shockwaves, a total upheaval. They had hard proof that a basic assumption about how the universe worked, about its fundamental geometry, was wrong. It meant nature does distinguish between left and right, at least when the weak force is involved. It was a fundamental asymmetry built into the laws of physics. And that must have just blown things wide open. Completely. It forced physicists to rethink everything they thought they knew about symmetry. And it opened up totally new avenues of research, especially connecting to things like why there's more matter than antimatter in the universe, that's another big symmetry puzzle. It's amazing how questioning one obvious thing can cascade like that. Yeah. Now, connecting this back, you mentioned Yang was also deep into statistical mechanics earlier in his career. How does that fit in? Seems quite different. Well, on the surface, maybe. Statistical mechanics deals with the behavior of large systems with many components, like gases or liquids, finding the overall rules from the chaos of individual parts. But if you think about it, both fields, statistical mechanics and fundamental symmetries, are about uncovering the underlying rules and patterns that govern behavior. One looks at complex systems, the other at fundamental particles. Mm. Okay, I see the connection. In both areas, Yang was essentially asking, are the patterns we see absolute and universal? Or do they depend on the context, the scale, the forces involved? Working in statistical mechanics likely honed his ability to think flexibly about rules maybe gave him that intellectual courage to say, hey, what if the symmetry rule isn't as universal as we think? That makes a lot of sense. It's not just a sudden leap, but built on a way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So looking back, it's quite a journey from that kid on the Cinque campus yeah. to studying under Fermi in Chicago, the architect mm -hmm. of the nuclear age, mm -hmm. then Princeton, and ultimately challenging this bedrock belief, this silent truth that physics had held for decades. Mm -hmm. His legacy is just baked into the standard model now. Absolutely baked in. It's permanent. And the story of Yang and Lee, it's a powerful testament to intellectual bravery. The very idea that something as basic, as intuitive as mirror symmetry could just be wrong, or at least not universally true. It shows you that in physics, even the principles that seem most solid need constant testing. They need proof, not just, you know, comfortable assumptions. Right. It's a constant process of questioning. Which really leads to a final thought for you, our listener, to consider. If a concept as seemingly fundamental as left-right symmetry turned out to be conditional, not absolute, what other absolute truths about nature, the assumptions we hold today, might just be waiting for their own challenger? What else might not be quite as symmetrical or simple as we think? Hmm. Something to ponder, definitely.